A warm welcome once again to the League of the Genuine Conversations with me, Fred Mwema. <clears throat> Every Friday, we are with you discussing the important, the big subject uh, of counterfeits. Uh, we are still continuing our discussion with the issue of counterfeits in trade, business, and industry. We had uh, a little break uh, when the issue of COVIDX uh, made center stage. We are now through with that. I'm sure you are able to benefit from the discussions that we had on that subject. We are continuing uh, with the discussion on counterfeits in trade, and we feel that this is an extremely important subject because trade business is what drives the economy and we are all part and parcel of the economy. <clears throat> we have uh, a special guest uh, today to discuss uh, the subject of counterfeits. Uh, my friend, the executive director um, of the Uganda Manufacturers Association, uh, Mr. Daniel Bironji, you are welcome. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Uh, Mr. Daniel, the Uganda Manufacturers Association is such an important organization or entity mm -hmm. in the Ugandan economic space. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the very first public lecture that I had on counterfeits uh, almost 12 years ago was at the Uganda Manufacturers Association. But there's a feeling, you know, we had a guest here, uh, Dr. Patrick Bitature, uh, a leading businessman. Mm -hmm. And he was complaining that uh, we have a problem in Uganda. Uh, Ugandans are docile, they have this Ubuntu, uh, they, they are carefree, so counterfeits have come and run us down. We are choking on counterfeits. Does that uh, statement from Dr. Bitature refer to WUMA? Are you docile? We're not hearing enough action coming out of WUMA. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fred, for having us as WUMA. Uh, I will say that no, we are not, we're certainly not docile, not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, several of our actions, especially I will restrict my discussions on the counterfeit issues, several of our actions on counterfeits have been uh, uh, showcased in the media. Uh, could there be more to be done? Certainly, because uh, counterfeits and counterfeiting is not something that can be fought uh, on one prong alone. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a discussion that has to involve, of course, the private sector, the people who are producing the items. It's a discussion that has to involve the consumer. It's a discussion that has to involve government. Part of what we have embarked on as an association is that within the different sectors that we have, we are embarking on an information campaign where we inform the consumer of what exactly a quality product looks like, what it should feel like, what it should taste like, so that the ability of the consumer to differentiate is heightened. Relatedly, uh, we have also worked quite closely with uh, the Bureau of Standards. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, Uganda does not have a specific anti-counterfeit uh, statutory body. But working through the ambit of <coughs> the NBS, we've been able to go out into the field and uh, in addition to seizing uh, products that are not uh, up to standard or a counterfeit in this case, we've also had an opportunity to engage with the traders under CASITA to educate them on what they should stock. I can tell you that, for example, within the course of this month, we are putting out a publication on uh, steel, because one of the areas where there were significant challenges was steel, where there were uh, rebars that were problematic, were counterfeit. There were rebars that did not meet the specifications. And so it's a continuous process. It's an expensive process. Uh, but I believe that we are, uh, we are pushing to ensure that we address the issue of counterfeiting in this country. <coughs> uh, Daniel, you say that uh, you have taken steps to try and push back counterfeits. Mm. Uh, and you say a lot of it can be seen in the media. And yet, uh, aside from what you're doing in the media, 
-hmm. on the ground, counterfeits are flourishing. Mm -hmm. Even the UNBS that you say you collaborate with uh, in this area uh, has admitted that uh, most of the products, more than maybe 60% of the products on the market are counterfeit. And yet, counterfeiting of products uh, revolves around the production of these products. Mm -hmm. And you are the producers, you mm -hmm. are the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, our experience uh, in fighting counterfeits is that most of the manufacturers either are not aware of the implications of counterfeiting on their products, or they are just negligent. Many actually uh, in the past decade uh, have not shown willingness to go out when they are informed that they are duplicates of their products. Many uh, are not willing to take action. And then there is another problem. Mm. Sometimes there are internal weaknesses within the production line itself. Some staff of the manufacturers are doing side business of duplicating mm. uh, their employers' products. What can you say is the strategy that WUMA has employed to tackle those vices or those issues that I, I have pointed out? Uh, part of the strategy is around, uh, uh, one, is that we are looking to bring on board more manufacturers. Because even as we speak... How many do you have now? 1,300. Yeah. But as you know, we have 5,420 manufacturers in this country, per state house statistics. That being the case, we are only helping a small percentage of those who are in the manufacturing sector, hardly 25, 23%. So why are so the uh, almost 80% joined? Is it because you are not uh, attractive enough in your programming? Well, that's what we're working on, to get them on board. But back to the question on, uh, on what are we doing. For the 1,300 uh, that we have, part of what we are doing is training on what the risks of counterfeiting are. Because like you said, there is probably an absence of knowledge in some cases. The other element we're working on is that we recognize that the cost of tracking counterfeits is quite high. So within the sector associations that we represent, we are working with the individual sectors so that there is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange of information. If you have counterfeits appearing in your neighborhood, in your market, in the places that you're serving, even if they do not, uh, conf even if they do not belong to your company or they, do not, they are not tied to your company, you bring it up so that we can then work with the relevant authorities to follow up on those aspects. The third element is information. Because at the end of the day, the person who is going to be at the forefront of fighting counterfeits is the consumer. If the consumer chooses to go for a product uh, in spite of knowing that it's counterfeit, then at that point you've lost. You, you, there's nothing you can do about it. But what we are working on then is to get the public to understand what a quality product looks like. To also get to understand what is the realistic base price for a product? Because at the end of the day, having factored in raw material cost, conversion cost, uh, and, and a small markup, you can tell that there is no way this product can get onto the shelf at X amount. So if you find it at this amount, there's a problem. If you find it's lacking this or the other, there's a challenge. If you find there's a differentiation when you put the tea in the, in the cup, you know that it doesn't belong to this company. But there's a deleage of, 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 of counterfeit products. And to expect one entity to, to fight it is, 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 is to live in utopia. What we need to work on, and, and this is something we've been on record as saying, what we need to work on is a concerted effort where there is uh, action from the manufacturers, there is action from the government, the is action from the consumer. Relatedly, on the issue of uh, internal weaknesses, it's, it's a key problem. And as part of our risk mitigation initiative as uh, Uganda Manufacturer Association, we're engaging with members 
to help them appreciate the areas of risk within their production processes. Because at the end of the day, we hire Ugandans. We don't, we, we, there is no special place we go to to hire the people. So as long as these vices still exist within our society, they will crop up within the factory setting. <coughs> the question is, how do we put in place controls <coughs> so uh, that we control these Daniel, vices? Mm. We are talking about counterfeits. It's a very serious issue. Mm. And I've heard you saying, you know, it's expensive to fight it. But I'll also tell you it's expensive to ignore it. Yes. Because I know businesses that have closed mm -hmm. uh, because they are killed by competition from the fakes. Can you tell us, mm. in your membership of 1,000 awesome members, mm. how many of them are counterfeiters? Do you have counterfeiters in your ranks? And what do you do to stop a counterfeiter or somebody who is dealing in unethical practices mm. from ga gaining admission? And can you expel them? Have you thrown out people who, who you later found are, are dealing in fakes? Because there's a problem we, right in there. Yes. We do have a rigorous uh, onboarding process as an association because uh, you have to apply, first of all, to join. You have to be seconded by existent members. You have to qualify on the ethical basis. You have to fulfill your obligations as far as ethics are concerned in terms of compliance with statutory requirements. And that is when you join. Now, having joined, we have a peer review mechanism where within the sectors, we are able to call out members who are going against. So you are judges case. in your own case? Uh, no, we're judges. not judges in our own case. And here is why. Because uh, if we are in the same sector, myself and yourself, you, it's in my best interest that you are doing the right thing. Because at the end of the day, if you are not, you're going to undercut uh, pricing on my product. But beyond that, when, 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 when someone buys, let's say, a faulty riba and their building collapses, they're not going to say, I bought it from Fred. They will say, the manufacturers have given me a faulty riba. And that is the message we've been putting into our sector, that at the end of the day, it's our core responsibility, each of us, to keep to be our brother's keeper. <coughs> because if we don't do that, the, 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 the trust in our products goes down. And so that is the basis of so, how we so, work. So the way you deal with the counterfeit issue uh, appears to be maybe a bit casual or simplistic because counterfeiting is, a, is organized crime. Mm -hmm. It's an offense mm. uh, under the laws of this country. Uh, so I would have thought that maybe if you've caught any of your members mm -hmm. committing this crime, mm -hmm. You would hand them over to the authorities and escort them to jail. Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you that having gone through the peer review mechanism, if you are found to have walked away from the ethics that are required of you, you are reported for prosecution. Because, like I said, it's a serious issue. And the impact is on companies. The impact is on jobs. The impact is on a lot of things. So through our processes, we engage the members through the sectors. We put them to task. If they are found to be non-compliant, we take it a notch further and work with the relevant agencies to push for prosecution of these. We also go down to the consumers, because right now we're doing something with CHADA, the Hardware Dealers Association, around now getting them to understand that if you stock products from Daniel, you are doing it at your own risk and we shall come down on you and swoop you as the hardware dealer and get you into prison. We shall also confiscate the items you've bought so there will be an impact on your, on, on, on your bottom line. But at the end of the day, we shall also get the, 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 the manufacturer and expel them because they are not conforming to the initiatives that we put in place. Beyond that, we are also going to conform the consumers to say, look, do not buy items from Daniel, because Daniel, in spite of our initiatives to try and get them in line, has refused to comply with our standards. So those are the steps. And yet, despite all those well-intentioned, mm. uh, because I believe you, you're trying to do your best to, to tackle this thing, and yet, despite all that, uh, I can tell you, because we are on the ground, mm -hmm. we are not feeling the impact. You mm. saw the 
Uh, there was a recent story uh, on uh, fake cement mm. somewhere in Tororo. Mm. That is not the first story about faking of cement, mm -hmm. building materials. It's recurring. Mm. I, I can speak with authority that I think the consumer is getting a raw deal mm. uh, because even when swaps or reductions are done, mm. the, 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 the company or the brand that does the action Apart from the two minutes on TV in the mm. news that they caught these steel bars, mm. there is no additional information that is shared uh, with the consumer. For example, there is no information that will help the consumer to identify that fake steel bar. Mm. What are the specifications? Mm. Uh, there, will no, there will not be information from the brand uh, telling the consumer how the genuine steel bar should look like. Mm. There will be no information uh, to the consumer telling them where to buy, even where to buy mm. the genuine product will be. So in the end, you will have a well-intentioned, woman-supported uh, swap or raid going hand in hand on the same day with another counterfeiter who has not been caught selling actually the, mm. the very fake product. So <laughs> there's a feeling that the consumer is being left out mm. because the consumer has a big problem. We know it here that the consumer cannot differentiate between the genuine and the fake. What is WUMA doing with its membership to help the consumer to differentiate the genuine from the fake product? Like I said, we organize ourselves in sectors. What we're doing with the sectors is, to your point exactly, we've delineated the markers of quality products. What differentiates a fake steel bar from a non-fake steel bar? We've gone ahead to publish this information. Where is it published? In the newspapers, on our website, in our company websites. This information exists. Do you have like radio we've programs? We've also gone ahead. No, we don't have radio programs. But we've also gone ahead to go into the off-takers of these products to train them on how to differentiate quality from non-quality items. We've gone ahead to engage with the Bureau of Standards around spotlighting what quality should look like. But one of the, or the other key uh, activities, that we, one of the other elements that we use, which unfortunately we haven't had a chance to use, is through a, uh, an engagement with the consumer, direct engagements with consumers through our barazas and our trade fairs that we hold. Because we hold these events for purposes of the consumer getting an understanding of what quality product looks like and what a non-quality product looks like. Now, could we be doing more? Certainly, everyone could be doing more. You speak to the impact of counterfeits and the fact that uh, they're getting too many and the consumer is getting a, a raw deal. I would have you know that it's not a Ugandan, it's not only a Ugandan problem. Internationally speaking, there is growth in counterfeiting. So, it Even has reached a trillion dollars now. Yes, it has reached a trillion dollars. It's projected by 2023 to reach 1.8 trillion. Now, that being the case, whatever we do cannot be only focused on, the, on, on Uganda, but we, could, we can also learn from what others are doing. A key need is that once these counterfeiters are formed, that there is follow through in terms of ensuring that they do not get back into their counterfeiting ways. What does this mean? This means that there is a, a, there's a need for, for example, a UNBS level kind of initiative that focuses on counterfeit. UNBS focuses on standards, which is a whole different case because you and I both know that a counterfeit product can still be up to the standard uh, as far as is required. Now, that being the case, we need some action on that front. The second element is that private sector can only do so much. Because at the end of the day, if we went around enforcing standards only, I mean enforcing uh, on counterfeits only as our core business, it would bankrupt us. So while we continue Counterfeits to will bankrupt you before. Uh, well, we've survived, we'll survived this long. <laughs> but true, to, the point is that I think there is need for more action from all parties in order to address counterfeiting because at the end of the day it can't be left to one entity. 
Uh, lastly, perhaps just to expound on the issue of consumer engagement, uh, I think it's important also that the consumer takes interest in the product they are buying. I can't tell you the number of times we've met consumers who go to a hardware shop and all they want to know is that I want three kilograms of nails. I don't care whether they have mark, whether you've told me that they should have this marking or the other, should be packaged like this, should do this. It doesn't matter to me. I want three kilograms, which is the cheapest version of, of three kilograms you can give me, and I'm out of there. Now, that requires a mindset change, that we as consumers have to understand that counterfeits have a significant impact on us. I mean, as a country, pretty much the middle class aspires to a house, let's say, as one of the items they have to tick off. But having managed to spend 300 million or 150 million or whatever on building your house, ask anyone if they paid attention to the quality of ribas they were using in their house. Several of them will say, no, I went for the, the fund, he told me I needed the ribas, I went and bought whatever was affordable. And as long as we, we don't yeah, solve but the that, problem, I think, is an issue. Yeah, but Daniel, mm -hmm. Whereas you will blame the consumer for just going to buy the rebars and the nails, just mm. like that. Mm. But that's how, how the manufacturers advertise. You tune on the TV now. Mm. If they're advertising iron sheets, they will just say strong like an elephant or like mm. a lion, mm. and uh, it's the best buy it mm. here. Mm. There is no single advert in this country where a product is advertised and specifications uh, and qualities of, of, of the product or details or even information about how to differentiate or how to look out uh, for the fake version because literally every product in this market has a fake version but brand owners live in denial they mm. say no my iron sheet for us this is what we do but they are fake versions mm. so the way products are promoted to the consumer mm. you, you are just promoting consumerism Mm. You are not, there is no anti-counterfeit policy or in the advertising and so on to, mm. to, to make the consumer look out for, for danger. There is none. So, so that's why the consumer just goes and says, give me five kilos of nails. Mm. Because there is no warning. Mm. In fact, this is the only program on the planet where we are saying, mm. as you're buying those nails, watch out. Mm. There could be fake versions of that. But now when you ask a nail manufacturer to sit there mm. and tell the consumer, look in the camera and say, mm. look, this is the genuine nail. This we found on the market mm. in the swap. It was fake. Mm. Don't buy this. Mm. Buy this. They don't want to come. Mm. What they say is, oh, we don't want uh, people to think our product has a problem with counterfeits. Mm. Uh, we want to. So this ostrich approach is it you who tells the the brands <laughs> to put their uh, to, uh, I'll, I'll say this to that advertising is uh, i mean you have 60 seconds in which to say everything you want to say about your product but to your point about I, I want to move us to what are we doing to address that because yes you raise a key issue that consumer knowledge is critical what we're doing to 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 address the issue of consumer knowledge is that we are actually going out into the field and educating consumers to say these are the things to look out for when buying these products. This information is actually available on the manufacturer websites as well. Because at the end of the day... You Why not at the point of sale? Why don't you have in the supermarket? If I'm at going the to buy, points of sale... Why put on a website? Because at the end of the day, the decision to put up signage in supermarkets is a decision of the supermarket owner. We don't own the retail outlets. What we can do is that we can manage the, the knowledge as far as it's related to the areas we control. In our dealerships, it's clear. I have seen them in some supermarkets. Mm. There are some young ladies there okay. on the row. I think I've seen them for detergents. Mm -hmm. they, they will pass around and uh, try to accost you to, to mm. buy or give you some. But the uh, only thing they are telling you to do... Uh, accost is a bit. <laughs> okay, they, they will accost <laughs> they, you nicely. They will encourage <laughs> they will encourage you to, to buy. Yeah. Okay. The only thing mm. they will tell you, mm. buy, 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 buy. Mm -hmm. They are not going to warn you mm. that please look out uh, if the packaging is not like mm. nothing. This mm. is the complaint. There mm. is no product information. Mm. And this is what the counterfeiter mm. 
mm. is exploiting mm. to make a product that cannot be differentiated from the genuine. Mm. And I am saying, can you in your consumer engagements, mm. in, in the brand engagements, do more to mm. help the consumer identify what the fake is? Mm. So, so that you, you, you're not living in denial uh, that we don't have a problem. Because no, no, no. I, I, Fred, I agree there's a problem. And I agree more needs to be done. On that, on those two elements, we're 100% agreed. What I'm saying is that while it's, we would require it done yesterday, we failed to do that. What we are working on is, is that as we move forward, we are doing quite a bit to address this. The secondary thing is that I'm also saying that the consumer needs to pay attention to the products, needs to do a bit of research. When you are taking your child to school, to a school, you're going to go and look through their statistics, how have they performed, how, why is it that when you're building your house, you're not paying attention to doing the research to understand, because this information is available. Is it widely available? Maybe it could be better available. I agree. But at the end of the day, let's also play a role. Because counterfeits affect us at individual level. When you take fake medicine, what happens? You end up in hospital, you end up dead. We shall provide the information, but it's impossible for us to make the information available everywhere. Because we don't have the finances to do so. We can only do as much as we're able to. But I agree with you that we need to engage our retail outlets more. Perhaps we need to get uh, standard uh, documentation that we put there. But then how many people <coughs> pick it up is also another question. Daniel, there's a complaint mm. that uh, not only are the manufacturers not doing enough to fight counterfeits, mm. but they also fail to produce enough in critical areas. Mm. Uh, for example, we are in a COVID pandemic, mm. but many people have died mm. because of a shortage of oxygen. Mm. Uh, you guys, uh, <clears throat> as manufacturers, have failed uh, to seize the opportunity mm. to avail to the market uh, the required and sufficient amount of oxygen mm. that we need to save lives. Uh, so, uh, can I answer that? Yes, why, uh, why are you failing to, 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 to manufacture oxygen? I'll actually stop you right there because that starts off on a false premise. Mm. And here is why. As Uganda Manufacturers Association, within our membership, we've mobilized about 15 members who are giving government free oxygen, not for sale, free oxygen from their plants. Because as part of the production process of steel, you're required to set up a, an oxygen plant to facilitate the furnaces. Do you know the challenge? The challenge is that we do not have enough cylinders in the country. The issue is not oxygen, actually. We do not have enough cylinders to take the oxygen that we can provide. If you combine the capacities we have as a nation and that we've mobilized as OMA, we have sufficient capacity to produce oxygen, but the storage elements are the problem. Your question is then going to be, why don't we invest in, 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 in cylinders yeah, uh, exactly. for, for oxygen? The cost of, of, of setting up a cylinder production facility can only be justified when the market is adequate. Even as we speak, I think the only country on the African continent that has a cylinder manufacturing entity is probably South Africa, if it's not closed yet. As a continent, we import most of our cylinders from China. So the investment required is too high. But we have stepped up as far as uh, especially COVID is concerned on oxygen, on PPE, on uh, sanitizer, on a lot of areas that a year ago were not seen as Ugandan products. But today, go to any street, you'll find uh, uh, marked, made in Uganda, uh, whatever, uh, what are they? Masks. Masks on the market. You find sanitizers in any supermarket you'll walk into at an affordable price. So if somebody said that uh, Ugandan manufacturers are only uh, doing the small things, mm. masks and so on, mm. we have the oil and gas sector opening mm. up. Mm. You have known about this mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm. Uh, so you've had sufficient time to leverage and, uh, and prepare yourself. Mm. A lot of jobs are going to come under local content mm. uh, uh, for the local 
entrepreneurs and manufacturers. Mm. Mm. How is WUMA preparing its membership mm. to exploit uh, the opportunities in the oil and gas sector? Because um, we are worried that we are famed for producing a lot of fakes. Mm. We are worried that uh, we might lose out on the opportunities in the oil and gas sector because mm. the standards there are very high. Mm. How is WUMA preparing? UMA is preparing by uh, educating its members on the quality that is required within these sectors. But to take you back, uh, even as we are inundated with counterfeits in the country, some made here, some not made here, by the way, uh, our products continue to, 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 to break through and to shock where? the to world. Kenya. Across, Kenya across has thrown us out on maize. No, uh, well, that's maize. It's eggs. Uh, uh, yeah, the uh, EU threw us out on yes, beef. But but uh, we, with we, with all due respect, Fred, eggs, uh, maize, and 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 uh, and beef are not manufactured. They are man now to manufactured. They, they, to they speak are manufactured. To, <laughs> I think they are also manufactured products. <laughs> to speak to manufactured products. Uh, let me let me let me speak to manufactured products. I'll give you an example. A very like Is that example. a poultry farm uh, uh, a member of the Uganda manufacturers? Wouldn't uh, it qualify? Only if it processes at the end of the day. If it processes. Not not just to, to, to make to, to, to do the eggs. But to your point, you asked about quality of, of Ugandan products. And I'll tell you this. That about uh, uh, six years ago, we went before uh, uh, before the Ministry of uh, Energy. And we're talking about the dams that were coming up uh, for construction. By then, we're looking at Isimba, Karuma, and a couple of other smaller dams. And I said, look, we have enough steel and cement to supply these. Why are you issuing EPC contracts? They said, no, but the Chinese say you don't have adequate capacity, or you don't even have the standard, the quality. I said, no, no worries. Here are our samples. But you're free to come at any point surprise us and pick samples, or go to the market and pick samples, and go and test them. And then let's come back for a discussion. What happened was our products as Uganda were beating the products that are coming from China that were being used in the dams at that point. That and is so according to who? That was a tick. No, that was according. These, these, uh, these reality, materials were sent to Paris for checking. They were not tested here. They were sent to Paris for testing and were brought back, and the results showed that our products were better. So as far as quality, the, the point I'm trying to make is that our members have really gone ahead to address the quality aspect. And the proof, is in the, 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 the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And here is the eating bit. That today, Uganda is exporting iron sheets, is exporting ribas, is exporting all these items across East Africa. Today, if you went to Zambia, the as far as Zambia and Southern Africa, a lot of the hair products used are made by Movit in Uganda. If you went to Canada today, they're using PPE manufactured right here in Uganda, exported there. What is PPE? PPE masks, uh, oh, the, masks for, the, uh, for the for the medical protective the gear. protective gear is manufactured here. If you went to uh, the US, they're importing milk from Uganda. So I think we've proved ourselves. And even if you went and checked our standards levels against the standards of our, uh, our neighboring countries, and really across the world, we are aiming to produce that international standard. Because we do understand that in the area of the African continental free trade area, you cannot produce for Uganda. You have to produce at a standard that is beyond even what you're offered here. That's why you'll find several of our members are ISO certified, not because they have to, but because they want to raise the bar. To be part of the international yes, market. Part of the international but how market. are we going to really supply the international market, as you say? I can see you're very optimistic. Mm. When our manufacturing contributes less than 10% to GDP, mm. we're, we're a small economy, but even much smaller mm. is the manufacturing sector in this small economy. How, why are we not growing? And mm. yet you are talking of some very good grand plans and so on. What has stifled mm. the growth of manufacturing in Uganda? Uh, I'll first correct you and say that we've actually grown because right now we're at 15.6% It has GDP, moved to 15. Which is an excellent growth. It's an excellent trajectory. Uh, 
over the past year, of course, we know what has happened. As a nation, we've been under, this is now the second version of the lockdown. And of course, that has impacted productivity. We are having bottlenecks to access to some of the markets that should be our natural markets, because we all know what has happened with Rwanda over the past, uh, what, two, three years. We have been unable to take products there. But I'm optimistic based on the fact that we now have a development plan that speaks to manufacturing as a key element. We have the potential to export up to $8 billion worth of products to, to DRC. All we need is the ability to access. That's why you have built the roads That's there. why we are looking to the, the roads DRC as, as an opportunity and potholes, yeah. for us to, to get into. Well, the, the, the expos to DRC will fix will your potholes. Will fix the potholes. Here. How long will the, that take? Probably, yeah, at most. But the other bit is that we are also saying, look, if we want to get to Kinshasa, because if you go to a Kinshasa supermarket today, you're going to find milk made in France. You're going to find cheese made in France. You're going to find yogurt made in France and a lot of other products that we have in plenty here. And the argument has been, let's focus on revamping Uganda air cargo so that we can airlift our products into DRC as well. Let us focus on exporting more than peace to South Sudan and Somalia. What are the bottlenecks? The bottlenecks are security. The bottlenecks are an export guarantee scheme. Can we put this in place so that our people can get into these markets with the knowledge that even if I take my product there and they fail to pay me or I face insurgency, I'm going to be able to come back and recoup because I have insurance that has covered me. So there are infrastructure challenges. Infrastructure in terms of soft infrastructure, that would be insurance, that would be banking and convertibility of currencies. But there are also infrastructures and hard infrastructure that relates to roads that re uh, relates to uh, uh, cargo planes. Once these are solved, believe you me, we have the capacity to take over this continent. In our lifetime? In less than our lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yes. Uh, before we conclude, yes. there is a general talk that uh, some of your members mm. are actually uh, taking a stand uh, against uh, fighting any measures that are designed to mm. to rid the market of counterfeits. Mm. Uh, we organized uh, a dialogue, I think last year, mm. about the digital tax stamp. Mm. Uh, and the commissioner from URI mm. was there mm. and he said, you know, this digital tax stamp uh, is a tool that is going to make sure you don't have any fake cigarettes, uh, water, beer, those things. Mm. And then the manufacturers came up in arms. I mm. think you are still doing some advocacy mm. on this. Mm. Why are you fighting the digital tax stamp? Mm. 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 We actually welcome the digital tax stamps. Tax stamps. You we've welcome it by fighting it? No, no, let me explain. Yeah. We've been very clear that digital tax stamps, as a measure, is a measure we welcome because it helps bring more people into the formal sphere. The challenges we have with the digital tax stamp are several. Number one is that the target of the digital tax stamp so far, as far as implementation is concerned, has been the people who are already uh, formalized, they already set up, they already know where they are, their products are well marked, well labeled, and meeting the standard and not counterfeiting. The people who are counterfeiting are not doing it with a signpost in front of their, of their shop that says this is Daniel, he manufactures this. They're doing it in garages, in underground places, where you are, it does not reach. And we've said as long as you are only focusing on the formal, the only thing DTS is going to do is drive up the cost of production for the formal while making counterfeits cheaper. And we need a more holistic approach. That's number one. The second So one, you expect that it can be introduced en masse everywhere. Can it start with a few that are formal? We've asked for a trajectory to say even as you start with the formal, because naturally you would start with the formal. Uh, it's important that you tell us when do you roll it out? When do you enforce against those who are not uh, doing the right thing? 
and uh, that is that, that uh, therein lies the challenge but that would be secondary and that we would work through that but the second element is that the cost of these stamps is expensive our argument has always been that look it's a measure introduced to help you better understand how we are producing so if it's a measure for yourself why don't you pay for it through the so much money that you're saying you're going to save. Let government foot this. Because then we won't have a problem. Actually, today, if government came out and said, look, it's okay, we are paying for these stamps. It would mean quite a big difference. I'll tell you that there are companies in here, multinational companies, which had planned to make investments of up to $5 million in expanding their production processes. But they've had to cut that because $2.5 million of that is now going into paying for digital tax stamps, which wasn't. And I'm told you plan. pay a Swiss company out there. Yes. It, Don't we have uh, Uganda printings? Can't those stamps be made here? Exactly our point. We've said, look, why don't we use a cheaper option that's available locally? Because our issue is go ahead, let's introduce the stamps. It helps all of us. But the cost. But, but Daniel, mm. if this is a very critical issue, mm. I have uh, seen the woman of those days in 2012. Mm. Mm. Um, you hired my services to, to go to court and uh, mm. file some case when the power tariffs were up and so mm. on. Mm. But why is it that uh, uh, woman wants to become docile or not? I don't know. Mm. Why is it that you don't take action? Mm. That is a very critical point that mm. uh, uh, you have raised about the digital stamp. Mm -hmm. What has happened? Why, why are you sitting ducks mm. and not coming out to take action? Because who suffers mm. when you don't take action? It's with the consumers. Mm. You're passing the cost to us. Mm. What has happened to you? Mm. Is it COVID that has made you? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you that. Uh, we do, we're taking action. These are conversations, even as I speak about them now, these are conversations that are ongoing with government to try and find a solution. Because we believe that we can find a solution. We believe that the facts are on our side. We've presented them, we await feedback. If the feedback is not forthcoming, certainly we, have, we are okay to go the nuclear option. And we've told government this, that if we do not find resolution in this, we'll move to court. And remember, manufacturing is a, is, is, is a volumes game. So 50 shillings looks like little money. But when that you multiply it by a million bottles produced a day, that's 50 million shillings a day. That's not going to URA. It's going to a separate company that is then repatriating that money to Switzerland. And we're saying, no, this money could do a lot more in our country. So as the executive director of uh, Uganda Manufacturers Association, what are you promising? Uh, the Ugandan consumers. Mm. What are you going to do differently? What are we going to do more of? Uh, not necessarily different. What are we going to or do better. More, more of or better is that uh, uh, we're going to, to get this information to, to the consumer uh, a lot better. Uh, we've taken note of the request to have uh, uh, retail level information or information brokers or placards or whatever, and we're going to study that and see how we can implement it. Uh, our members have already committed, because even before this, we've engaged with our members and agreed that we need to put out a name and shame list, that whenever we find counterfeit products, as an association, we shall work with UNBS and whoever is responsible to publish a list that says, look, we went to these shops, and found these, had these, these, these products. We're not saying don't go there, we're just letting you know that if you choose to buy from them, there is a possibility that you will find uh, faulty items. In the same vein, we're also going to put a spotlight on our members who are producing counterfeit products and have a stronger enforcement against them and, and an expulsion process that is strongly enforced. Because, like I said at the beginning, when one of us fails, all of us as manufacturers fail because someone will say, Ugandans manufacture fake products. Rather than saying, you see, uh, Daniel did manufacture a fake. Talking product. about Ugandans manufacture, mm -hmm. Uganda is a dumping ground mm -hmm. for a lot of fake imports. Mm -hmm. What is woman doing uh, mm -hmm. to save us from 
this flood of fakes coming from whatever. Pivok, is Pivok doing the job? Pivok is doing, uh, it's doing something. However, things seep through. Certainly, a lot seep through. Uh, what we are doing is that we believe that the best way to control uh, those items coming in is to produce better products locally. And our focus has been on recruiting more manufacturers into the manufacturing fold, uh, on sending the message that the same amount of money that you will use to set up a mall downtown is, can actually set up a factory that will earn you more in the long run, develop more jobs, and get you but, and, and I think we are breaking through because we've had a lot of conversions uh, of people who are in trade now going backwards and getting into manufacturing. Our belief is that if the manufacturing is done here and we do the enforcement better, we're able to control the quality of products that come out. It's a lot easier that way. But if we are relying on an external entity to manage what comes into our country, we, we, we are likely to face a challenge. So we are big proponents of local production we are big proponents of uh, import substitution. And uh, I think our members are picking up and taking up the challenge to do this. How is WUMA coping with uh, uh, manufacturing under COVID? I know you are essential workers. Uh, <laughs> what are essential are you, workers? Are you uh, having a decline or are you growing? Is manufacturing being boosted by COVID? No, definitely not. Uh, manufacturing has been hard hit by COVID. Uh, one, the addressable market has been heavily curtailed. Uh, I'll give you an example of the beverage sector. You and I both know that uh, 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 the beverage sector was benefiting from mass events quite a bit. They're the selling point for the beverage sector. And uh, to date, since COVID began, we've not been able to hold any of those, which of course affects uh, us. Generally speaking, there, is, uh, there, there seems to be less money in people's pockets because a number of companies have laid off people, uh, companies have cut back on salaries, companies have cut back on a lot of expenditure. As a result of that, there is less addressable money in the economy. Relatedly, schools are closed and you'll be shocked at how the school ecosystem ties into so many industrial production elements. If you're talking about maize millers, it's schools. If you're talking about the poultry sector, they only access maize bran because maize millers are working. If you talk about books and stationery, it's schools. If you talk about pens, if you talk about a lot of items, mattresses as well. So it's not a good time. We remain optimistic that things will get better. We know that uh, and we urge that there is an increased focus on vaccinating more people so that we get to the point where we are able to open up. Yeah. Does uh, Buy Uganda, Build Uganda, Bobo, mm. does it have a future if we don't seriously fight counterfeits? It has a bleak future if we don't fight counterfeits. And that's why as an, as a, as an institution and as manufacturers, it's something we're taking seriously. Uh, Bobo only makes sense and Bobo is only able to attract more proponents if we are able to demonstrate that we are cutting down on, on the possibility of you spending your money on a product that is not uh, up to the requisite uh, standards or requisite quality. That requires that we spend as manufacturers on educating the public, but we also call upon the public. Let's pay attention to the items we buy. Let's pay attention to where we're spending our money. Because at the end of the day, it's not only a monetary issue, it's also a health issue, it's also a safety issue, and therefore it's important. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Daniel Bironzi, for the very articulate and eloquent presentation we've had. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, done a good job. Uh, you've mostly defended uh, WUMA, uh, and uh, we have heard that uh, a lot of good plans and uh, programs uh, are coming through to see that uh, we fight counterfeits. The, the major message here is that uh, counterfeits cannot be fought by WUMA alone, by manufacturers alone, by government alone. Like we have always said, it is the duty 
of everybody for as long as you're a consumer of one or the other product. It's your duty to ensure that you take care, make that personal decision to buy genuine. So from us here, uh, the League of the Genuine, uh, we would like to sign off, but before we sign off, we'd like to thank those who have been watching us, those who are following us, uh, those who share our videos, those who give us the thumbs up. Uh, we appreciate that support. Uh, for those who are not sure, you can still give us a thumbs up because this is a program that is concerned with ensuring that you're safe with genuine product. We'd like to sign off by saying don't be fake, buy, sell, genuine only.